Uh, I'm Marcus Prince, I'm the television programmer here at the BFI. Um, this evening discussion forms an integral part of our wider love season that runs across the course of November and December at the BFI South Bank uh, and in conjunction with regional partners right across the UK. Uh, it encompasses both film and television and looks at love in the widest sense from the power of love to move us, from Dr. Zhivago to Brief Encounter, Fools for Love, those romantic uh, and ro those rom-coms and television comedies that revolve around relationships, and finally, the group of fatal attractions, those doomed love stories that don't quite end so well, uh, from Romeo and Juliet to, to Rose Raquel and Pandora's Box. Um, love is at the very heart of drama and comedy tonight. Uh, it's no exception uh, as we specifically focus on how well UK television has done in representing love and relationships for those with a disability over the years. The attitudes in the past had great progress that we've made, but also asking where we are now and what still needs to be done to fully integrate relationships between those with disability into the mainstream and put them on a fully equal basis and how television has, has assisted to change often deep-seated prejudices and, and, and perceptions, and indeed how those perceptions and, and prejudices need to be shifted in the future. Uh, we've got some fascinating clips of television programmes past and present to kickstart the debate, uh, and a fantastic panel lined up here for you. Um, and uh, we're reserving the last 20 minutes or so for you to ask the panel your own questions, so if you'd like to have some ready. Um, we advertise tonight as running 90 minutes, but we're going to extend it to quarter past eight uh, as we've got 45 minutes of clips. Uh, so just to give you time uh, to ask your questions. It could finish earlier than that. Uh, it's entirely up to you, ladies and gentlemen, how, how long you want uh, the questions to run as long as we finish by uh, quarter past eight. So to introduce our wonderful panel for you, uh, we have Nabil Shaban, uh, who is co-founder of Grey Eye 30 Company of Disabled Artists in 1980, of course. He's an actor, writer, filmmaker, spanning three decades, three and a half decades. Uh, his various roles have included Sill in Doctor Who, Jesus in Godspell, Hamlet, the Alatoya Komene, uh, Haile Selassie, and even the Marquis de Sade. Um, he was probably the first genuine wheelchair user to play a romantic lead on British television as George in Deptford Graffiti, as you'll see tonight. Uh, and Nadal has raised the profile of disabled people's love and sex lives in television drama and documentaries, beginning with Skin Horse on Channel 4 in 1983 through Telephone Dummies, a BBC drama in 1984. Um, Addy Warcliffe uh, runs the creative diversity team at Channel 4, where her role is to drive Channel 4's 360 diversity charter, it says here, uh, through the organisation, uh, including the 2016 Rio Paralympics. Addy has worked as a commissioning editor in Features, where her commissions include Daily Brunch, Britain's Youngest Carers, and Don't Blame Facebook. Uh, before joining Channel 4, Addy worked as a producer across both BBC and the independent sector, where her credits include Big Brother, Right to Reply, The Big Breakfast, and Stars in Their Eyes. And she's always looking for ways to develop diverse talent and plays a key part in Channel 4's ongoing commitment to reflecting the diversity of contemporary Britain. Alison Walsh has worked with commissioners and producers on a wide range of programming from Big Brother to How to Look Good Naked, The Undateables to The Last Leg, encouraging frank, authentic portrayal of disability. She commissioned two series for new disabled directing talent and the drama series Cast Offs and set up Channel 4's production training scheme, scheme for the disabled in 2006. Between 2010 and 12, Alison directed an, a, a national talent search for the training of disabled presenters and reporters to front Channel 4's London 2012 Paralympic coverage, and in August 2015, she joined the BBC as disability lead, charged with quadrupling disability portray portrayal by 2017. Uh, writer Jack Thorne began his screenwriting career on Shameless and Skins, uh, and uh, the, he wrote, of course, the darkly comic and groundbreaking Channel 4 series Cast Offs, broadcast in 2009. Jack's other television work includes The Fade, This Is England 86, 88, and most recently 90. Uh, Jack created the rural teen drama Glue for E4, and his original pan-European crime thriller The Last Panthers airs soon uh, in the UK. Uh, his royal court hit Let the Right One transferred to the West End in spring 2014, and he's currently writing Harry Potter and the Cursed Child for the West End next year. Uh, Ruth Maidley. Ruth is an actress known for the award-winning Don't Take My Baby in 2015. 
uh, and clips of which you'll see later on, uh, Half Moon Investigations from 2009 and Fresh Meat in 2011. Uh, your chairperson on the end here is Richard Reiser. Uh, Richard is the coordinator of UK Disability History Month, which is run each year uh, from 2010. He also runs World Inclusion Limited, uh, a consultancy and training organisation. He's written a number of books prior to this, uh, and prior to this was a teacher and educational advisor promoting um, inclusive education. In the 1990s, Richard coordinated the One in Eight group and its attempt to make the mainstream media more disability inclusive. This included organising the Raspberry Ripple Awards, uh, and Richard has been the producer of a number of short films and a consultant on a number of television programmes for Channel 4 and the BBC in the 1990s. Uh, we were hoping to have Victoria Wright with us this evening. Uh, she really sends her apologies. She'd love to have been here, uh, but unfortunately she's been struck by the bug that's going around in the moment. Uh, so we do wish her uh, a speedy recovery. So now without further delay, let me hand over to your chair for this evening, Richard Rice. Thank you. And I think... I think we, first of all, should thank Marcus for getting this together. He's done an enormous <coughs> amount of work sifting through hundreds of hours of clips to come up with what we've got. I came in and helped him for one day, but he'd done a lot of work before that. And uh, in a minute we're going to see sort of eight blocks of clips. <coughs> and uh, just a couple of things. That from the first clips that you'll see here in the 1970s, things have changed considerably in the way that disabled people see themselves and the way that we want ourselves to be portrayed. But the question is whether that really has changed in the way that most people see us, and whether the mass media can and does play a role in that, I'm sure is true, but how much and how it does that is another. At the UN, we've, we've been successful in 2006 in getting a universal human rights treaty through, which sees a paradigm shift from seeing the problem in the person, what we can't do, to seeing the problem in society, the attitudes and barriers that get in our way. But too often, in creative output, we still go back to those older ideas which are around us everywhere in the literature, art and theatre, culture, stories. Uh, and it's all too tempting to go back to those rather than to try and consult with disabled people about how we would like to be portrayed. And so you'll see a mixture of different things here. But I think uh, what's interesting, if we turn the focus on to um, sexuality and relationships, one of the persistent uh, stereotypes of us, and many authors think there are about ten stereotypes, so it's not just one dis disability, is that we're asexual and incapable of adult relationships. And I think what we'll see tonight is the very opposite of that. So. Without more ado, if we can start with the, the first uh, <laughs> set of clips, older documentaries. Thank you very much. nineteen seventies, how much do we think things have changed? I'll come to you first, Ruth, as a young person. Does that chime with you as a young person growing up in the, uh, the noughties and now? I think for me personally I was I was brought up in a in a family that where my disability didn't what wasn't really an issue at all. Um other than when hospitals had to be a part of our lives and things. Uh, growing up I guess I had an older sister and she she's able bodied and she um, most of the things I learned about boys I learned from her. So I was very lucky in that sense that I had somebody to guide me, but um, really I don't know where I would have gone because that otherwise because I always saw uh, my friends as having very different relationships than I would have as a young person with a disability. Um, I was always I guess the last time a boyfriend, all that kind of stuff, you know first kissing sex, all that kind of stuff, it was always, it always seemed a bit delayed for me and I think, I don't know whether that was partly me being a little bit guarded or the people around me, I'm not, I'm not 100% as to where that, where it was really. What do you think, Nabil? Well, 
I was kind of amused when I saw that there was this clip from 1976. Because actually, um, around that time, there was a campaign called Sexual Problems of the Disabled, called SPOT. And they, people were starting to wake up to the fact that disabled people might like sex and have relationships. And they started thinking, how, you know, it's not right, it's a denial of human rights that disabled people shouldn't find some kind of sexual expression. And throughout the 70s, there was this growing campaign to uh, bring sex into the disabled person's life. But some people were very nice brothel queens called Cynthia Payne, who were <laughs> operated down in Streatham. And uh, she would actually offer discount to disabled people. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, to, so they could. And there was a, a, another woman who's a great friend of. Um, Cynthia uh, called Tuppy Owens and she ran about the sort of early 80s she ran an, uh, uh, a contact club for several people called the Palsiders. It's still going. It's still going, really? yeah. And, but what I thought was amusing was I've been brought up in institutions. You know, I was in a hospital until I was nine uh, from the age of three to nine. I was in a children's home uh, from nine to sixteen and trying to find out anything about the birds and bees, so I'm trying to get blood out of a stone. And but I'd heard rumours that a man had something to do with making a woman pregnant, and I couldn't work out how that was. And I kept nagging the members of staff, and they didn't want to tell me, until eventually a local vicar came to tea. And I thought, well, one way to pressurise them to tell me is to ask him. <laughs> so uh, quickly they decided to tell me. But they gave me a very brief description of, uh, of what it was. Uh, basically, you know, the member of staff, uh, who's a, a middle-aged lady, a spinster. And uh, she said, uh, now, you know how boys have bullies? And, well, girls don't. Well, because I've never seen a naked girl before. And I was uh, 18, no. Um, I was um, about 11, I think. And uh, so I've never seen a naked girl before. And I said, so, so what have they got? They've got a hole. All right. And the boy puts his willy in the girl's hole, and she has a baby, and that's it. Right, off the bed. <laughs> and that was that. And in 1972, where I was now uh, 73, I was now 20, and the sexual problems of the disabled. I'd heard rumours of it, this campaign. I didn't really know that much about it. And um, I'd had a car accident, which basically meant that I had to go back to the children's home as an adult and uh, stay there for a year until I got myself sorted. And of course, I'm 20, and you've got these young men as the staff working there. And at one point, one of the members of the staff, for some strange reason, decided she wanted to seduce me. And um, she, you know, got me, carried me up the stairs and pumped me on her bed and all that kind of stuff. I was actually crap, actually, I couldn't do it. But um, what was amusing was that the next day, um, I went in for coffee uh, with the staff in the morning coffee session. And I was late coming in for their coffee. And this woman was sitting there. And one of the other members of the staff, a senior, said to me, oh, Nabil, perhaps you could um, you know, throw some light on it. What do you think of this thing about you know, facilitating disabled people having sex? And I went, uh, and I kind of tried not to look at the woman that I just slept with that night. <laughs> and she was going... <laughs> and uh, I went, I said that, I got a good idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cut you short there, yeah. I think you could go on all the way. Alison, when you first came to Channel 4, and the, you did some travel programmes before, I think, how was it, were we there, or we, had we moved on a little bit from what we've seen here? Uh, 90s, wasn't it? It was 90s, yeah. I mean, I think disabled people were very much in programs that are about their lives, mm -hmm. or they were in specialist <coughs> schools. 
I, mean, I think what was interesting about those two clips for me was the first one felt very much like I was being told the story by the disabled people themselves. The second one felt like a documentary where we were peering in at their lives. And yet, that one, the first one was older, wasn't it? Um, which was interesting. Um, but I think, because when I watched it, I thought we could learn a bit from this, actually, in terms of the frankness and how, in that little short clip, we got right into their lives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just it was just a time when there were there were. I'm not saying that there were programs that were bad or there were stories that were really wrong, but there was not enough at Channel 4 of disabled people just having relationships like anyone else, shown in mainstream shows. Um, so, yeah. And it was interesting in that the first clip we saw, the interviewer was also disabled, so that yes. was quite interesting. That was, that was quite, I, I thought, wow. I won't bring the others in, I'll have to bring you in on the next clip Brilliant. because we'll move on to the next one which brings us a bit further up looking at lifestyle and sex and these are taking us forward to 1999 which is four years after the Disability Discrimination Act came in and have things changed really. So let's see the next lot. The locus of power has shifted from the disabled people sort of asking for the crumbs from the non-disabled table to actually claiming their place there. But how generalised was that? And I'm not sure that today such programmes would be that acceptable. Perhaps they, though, both of those programmes, I think, went out on a late night schedule. How well would they have been uh, treated if they were on the mainstream, you know, nine o'clock slot? We would have had a very different uproar in the press. And whether, you know... Um, George Osborne in the current climate would be prepared to put money out to local authorities for disabled people to have subsidised sex. No. So quite a lot of issues there really. So I'll Even though he gets it. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, what, what, how does that strike you, the two first lots of clips we've seen and are we making progress and how do you see Channel 4's role now? Yeah, I mean, clearly sort of I, my team is sort of building on the work that Alison did for yeah. all those hundreds of years she was at Channel 4. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, so that's sort of where we are. But I, I think that f for me, what strikes me about those clips is that sometimes it feels like we've moved on and sometimes it feels like we haven't. So, you know, we did a show, I mean, you know, I can't take credit for it, it was a Channel 4 show as well, Alison was there, called The Sex Education Show. Mm -hmm. And one of the most memorable scenes in that is about disabled sex. Mm -hmm. And it's about people really enjoying sex and it really, and what's quite interesting from a Channel 4 point of view, not only is it sort of normalising it, but it also adds an extra creative dimension to our content because it's an extra way of sort of looking at sex. So I think it has <laughs> value for us in lots of ways and it felt like it was giving an authentic voice to, you know, sexuality of disabled people. So I think that's a good example, but I think there are other examples where we could probably be better, as I thought, from my sense. Jack, from the point of view of a writer and working on some sort of hit shows like Shameless and Skins and so on, how, how difficult is it to bring in these sorts of disability storylines and relationships in, into those sort of successful shows? Um, uh, you have to fight a bit, mm -hmm. um, uh, but actually if you do fight a bit then, then you find that you've got um, willing accomplices mm -hmm. on, um, on Skins I really wanted to tell a story about a teenage carer, and uh, and I said to Brian, um, I think it's important if we go. It, it, it was about her, um, uh, the, her mother had MS, and I said I think it's important if we are going to tell this story that the the mother should have MS. And as always with this thing, with these sorts of things, you know, there's there's limits to what you as a writer, where you as a writer can go. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, you do your research, you make sure you know everything. But then you learn from the performers, you know, like you know, and, and you give space in order to be able to learn from the performers. And in, in on, on that show in particular, on Skins in particular, I learned the shed load, um, and um, uh, and I think we we did a better job as a result. But. Okay. 
Well, we'll move on. Um, another particular group who maybe are even further down the pecking order are people, adults with learning difficulties and mental health issues. So let's have a look at how some of their issues have been portrayed. Thank you. Same period that that was uh, made, 1999, we'd had over 300 people first branches across England where the focus was on people with uh, intellectual impairment or learning difficulties doing it for themselves, so living independently and so on. But it, it is an issue, right back to the Royal Commission in the 1890s, which was based on false uh, science, said that a woman with learning difficulties having a child was likely to, seven times more likely to be disabled uh, was based on a complete statistical lie, and this has built into the eugenicist movement, which had devastating effects for disabled people in Greater Europe in the Second World War, and is still having impacts on films like Don't Take My Baby, where, in that which we'll see later on, but where for adults with learning difficulties, it's almost de rigueur that their children are taken into care, and that's in Britain in 2015. So these ideas, which are false ideas, have a very long hand. So what do, how do we think we can move this forward in terms of television? Because it, I'm not sure it's moved forward very much. There was, in fact, Alison, I seem to remember, an Australian show that you put on in your time, House Game, mm. which was uh, a group of um, disabled people living together in the community, which was one way of showing that people could be quite ordinary out there. Are there other ways that we could do that, move that forward? Yeah, I mean, I think um, House Game was very revolutionary at the time, and uh, um, it's, I don't think it's really been, the legacy of it has really been carried on. I think we see individual sort of dramas, and I remember there was a, a drama doc called uh, Richard, is my, Richard is My Boyfriend on um, Channel 4, uh, which was in this territory. But I think. Um, what we need to do is get a, a sort of a character in a long-running show or in a mainstream show, where you, you kind of it's not it's not a big it's not the only storyline. It's part of the fabric of the characters. Any comments, Nabil? Well, you know, obviously, because I'm old enough to have seen the development of trying to change perspectives. Uh, I've seen many things that have been done before 90s, like 83, The Skin Horse, which is about sex and disability. And um, there's also been a number of films. There was a, a film called The Eighth Day that was made in 97, oh, yeah, I think yeah, it was. Yeah. Fantastic film. But it had a cop-out ending mm. at the end. So you had two <coughs> genuine um, actors with learning difficulties, with Down syndrome, falling in love. It was a drama. It was a French film. Yeah. And it's brilliant. But the director couldn't... He bottled out because he couldn't allow them to live happily ever after. And he had the poor guy kill himself. Yeah. himself. And that is typical. There's always this couple, you know... They did it better in Antonia's line. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, that was, uh, that was in 97, I think, 96. Yeah. And, you know, you had Walter, which came out in 1982, which, okay, Ian McKellen was acting the part. And Walter and June was about a relationship between someone with uh, mental health issues, played by Sarah Miles, mm -hmm. and Walter, who had, you know, learning difficulties. And so that was 1982 that was dealing with that subject. And I just think we keep making two steps forward and one step back because we keep presenting to the public all these different kind of um, revolutionary ideas. And then we get kicked back and we end up, you know, rediscovering the wheel every decade. And a good example of that is the, the Spanish film 
Italian or Me Too, which actually stars uh, an actor with Down syndrome in the lead part, uh, who is actually uh, Pablo Pineda, who is the only person I know of yet in uh, Europe to get a master's degree and is a teacher. Uh, and he acts the part of a similar person trying to have a relationship with a non-disabled woman and then uh, it's a very interesting film. You know, I was in uh, Walter mm. and I was working with a lot of different people who were extras who had different disabilities, mm. a whole range. And one of the scenes that I was doing was a guy with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, he's so charismatic. He's such a good person. And I was thinking, why isn't he playing Walter and, the, and not Ian McKellen? And it annoyed me, which was the reason why, years later, I decided to write a play in which you had some of Down syndrome. Um, because I'm convinced, obviously, that people with Down syndrome can... They have a kind of um, reality to their performance, which most of us actors lack. And uh, I thought that about this particular guy. There was a, an episode of A Touch of Frost in 1997, I think, where there was a Timmy who had a love affair with another girl with Down syndrome. And actually, in the, back in the Raspberry Ripples, we gave it an award because they were just there. They just had the relationship as part of a two-hour drama series. But as you say, these are little blips on the horizon, and then it doesn't happen again for right. years. And I think. What, anyone else, why do we think there is this resistance to actually just bringing the diversity of disabled people into the mainstream? I guess, I think, going back to that, that idea of, of yeah. people with Down syndrome often yeah. being associated as children, I yeah. think there's a lot of fear and they don't... I, guess, I think a lot of it is fear. I think it's a whole fear situation. So I think if we could get rid of that fear, and, and like you said, get more people on board, like get, you know, have allies, get get people with Down syndrome involved in it, help sell the story properly. I think it will help alleviate that bit of Judaism that's in that bit still. Well, we'll move on and now have a look at uh, disability and factual entertainment and look at Unbreakable, uh, which was one of Alison's uh, programs. When, oh, sorry, undateable. <laughs> undateable. Uh, Unbreakable <laughs> or something else. <laughs> so, can we have the next uh, clips? Thank you.